So now we're going to talk about bookkeeping and accountability. So we're going to cover uh, three parts. So first we're going to talk about double entry bookkeeping. Uh, which has its origins in banks. So you have experienced this uh, when you're using your internet bank, for instance, and look at the, the transactions in your account. Uh, another uh, related part is separation of duties, which is an important part in uh, ensuring uh, accountability. And finally, we're going to talk about the Clark and Wilson security policy model, which is a model for how to securely implement uh, a policy and, and ensuring integrity in, in a system. But let's start with double entry bookkeeping. So the banks are one of the oldest institutions with a need for, for strict accountability. And this means that, yeah, they have developed uh, important tools uh, over the years and uh, the main tool is double entry bookkeeping and we're going to uh, look about this one now so double entry bookkeeping is simply that uh, you have two entries for each transaction so when you transfer money uh, you have one entry uh, which is a credit and another which is a debit. Uh, so when you uh, add these together, so if you add all the entries in all books, uh, the sum should be zero. Since you add x and minus x, it should be zero. So this is an invariant which uh, must be kept at all times. And if you sum up all the transactions in your uh, books, and you don't get zero, then there is something wrong. So all books uh, must be balanced uh, for this to be correct, otherwise there has been some uh, sort of fraud. So when you transfer money from one account to another, there must be a credit in one account and a debit in another. So if you transfer money from one account that you have to another account that you have, then you will see that it says minus x in one and plus x in another. And if you add them up, uh, they equal zero. Now, one uh, method to, uh, or technique to uh, try to ensure that uh, ensure correct behavior in a system is uh, separation of duties. And we have uh, basically two classes of separation of duties, dual control and functional separation. And in both of these, the main purpose is that you require two or more entities to collude to, to break the security policy. So for instance, in dual control, uh, two or more staff members must act together to authorize a transaction. So you've probably seen this on film, uh, where there are two guys in a nuclear weapons silo and uh, two keys which are uh, too far from each other for one person to be able to physically reach them simultaneously and turn them. Uh, so this means that both of these staffers must agree to turn the keys. So if you want to, to send off the, the nuclear uh, weapon, both these must uh, agree. So you can't have one extremist to, to infiltrate the, the nuclear weapon silo, silo, you need two. Which is of course less likely. Uh, the other one, functional separation, means that two or more staff members must act on the transaction at different points in the transaction path. Uh, so one example is that a developer team writes the code and a systems administrator, or several of them, uh, deploy the code. And uh, finally, there are auditors to verify that the code actually does what it's supposed to do, that it works correctly. Uh, so there you have uh, three different uh, actors that must uh, act on the uh, act on the transaction of deploying new code 
uh, to production. Uh, this functional separation is also common in uh, businesses and, and administrations in general, so even at the university. Uh, when someone needs to do something, someone issues uh, the start of a transaction, sends it to someone else who must also approve it and uh, send it on, for instance. So in the case of, in the case in, in Sweden, uh, or at least in, in one of the universities in Sweden, when you need to uh, establish a new course syllabus, it's like seven steps of uh, functional separation before it's finally approved and, and its uh, students can apply for the course. Now, finally, uh, the Clark and Wilson security policy model is supposed to help you uh, make a system like this work. So it's a model for securely implementing a security policy. And it ensures internal consistency. That is, it ensures certain properties of the internal state of the system. And it also allows for external consistency. That is, how the relation of the internal state to the physical uh, real world. Uh, however, this uh, must be enforced by auditing since it's uh, difficult for, for a system to achieve this otherwise. So there are two mechanisms uh, for enforcing integrity in this system. And these are well-formed transactions and separation of duties. And separation of duties we've already covered. Uh, so well-formed transactions simply means that uh, there is a limited set of functions which can manipulate an object and the users, they have access to these functions and not directly to the objects. So for instance, uh, there might be a file with transactions and then I'm not allowed to uh, read this and edit this file directly because then I can basically do whatever I want but there is a program which has access to this uh, file and this program is uh, written in such a way that it, it has a few specific transactions that I can do which modifies this file and uh, no other types of modifications are allowed. So that's, that's essentially what it means by well-formed transactions. Now, there are also some other requirements for the Clark and Wilson uh, security policy model. And these are that the subjects must be authenticated uh, so that you, you can do some, some access control. And the objects must be manipulated only by a restricted set of functions. So well, there we have the well-formed transactions. And subjects uh, can execute only a restricted set of functions. So this is also part of the well-formed transactions and uh, access control uh, for these functions. And finally, we have uh, a proper audit log uh, that must be maintained. Uh, for this system. And uh, of course, the, the system must be certified to work properly. Uh, so someone must uh, audit it. And we, we have two, uh, two different parts of data that is used in this system. And the first one is an unconstrained data item. And this is basically input that comes from outside the system. Yeah, so uh, it basically can be anything. So it's user input. So someone can write something in a, in a text field or anything. Uh, so it's something that comes into the system, uh, network data or, or something like that. And then we have constrained data items. So objects uh, or data uh, inside the system. And this is uh, under the system's control, so this is well formed. And uh, you can see the, the naming that constraint data item, since it's uh, controlled by the system, the, the system has ensured that uh, there are the constraints on these data items are valid. Whereas the unconstrained data items, yeah, they come from outside, so it could be anything. So it's totally unconstrained. 
And uh, these unconstrained data items must be converted to constrained data items. And this is a critical part of the system because otherwise the system wouldn't get any input. So we, we need to have some input from the outside world to the system, otherwise it's uh, quite uh, useless. So this is a core part of the system. And for this, we have uh, transaction procedures. So this is a procedure which either manipulates constrained data items, so it's a function from a constrained data item to another constrained data item. But uh, there are also transformation procedures which can take unconstrained data items as input and convert them to constrained data items. So this is really crucial. Uh, and there, is, uh, there are also integrity verification procedures and these only check the integrity of a constrained data item to, to ensure that it's, it's correct as, as it should be. And finally, there is uh, a number of certification rules that must be uh, checked and certified for, for a system for it to, to be uh, correct. And uh, uh, these uh, certification rules are about checking uh, the policy, so the policy is consistent, and then there are other rules to, to check uh, that the system actually enforces this policy. So the first certification rule is that the uh, integrity verification procedures must ensure integrity of these constrained data items when these in, uh, integrity verification procedures are run. So we must ensure that they actually work and that they work for all constrained data items. The second part is that uh, the transaction procedures must be certified to be valid. So valid uh, constrained data items must transform to valid constrained data items always. And each transaction procedure can also access a restricted set of constrained data items. So it cannot access anything. So you have some access control on these uh, transaction procedures as well. And all the access rules uh, that are in this system must uh, satisfy any separation of duties requirements. Uh, so we must uh, ensure that this is uh, enforced by the system. Uh, and um, all these uh, transaction procedures must write to an append-only log. Uh, this is to ensure that we can audit uh, the system to, to ensure that it, it works as correct. Uh, and uh, to, this will help with uh, external, uh, external consistency as well. And finally, any transaction procedure which uh, handles unconstrained data items must convert it to a constrained data item or reject it if it's not possible. Uh, so this is a really a crucial step uh, that could be abused by adversaries otherwise. Now the enforcement rules uh, describes the mechanisms needed in the system. So the previous one uh, allows us to certify that the policy that we have is actually, act that it actually makes sense. So now to make sure that the system actually uh, enforces this policy, uh, we must maintain and protect the list of constrained data items that each uh, transaction procedure can access. So this is basically how enforcing the access control for transaction procedures. And we must also maintain and protect the list of uh, transaction procedures that each subject can access. So this is access control for, uh, for the subjects in the system. And uh, finally, the, the system must, uh, act, uh, must authenticate each subject requesting to execute a transaction procedure. So this is, of course, crucial to make sure that it's the right uh, subject that is executing. And uh, also, 
uh, at the core is to, to change and update the, the policy, to, to update the system, only a subject that may uh, certify an access rule for a transaction procedure may modify the respective entry in the list. So this is uh, access control for administration of the system. And uh, we have a, an aspect of separation of duty here because uh, the subject who, who is allowed to uh, change the access uh, permissions uh, must not be allowed to execute that, uh, that transaction procedure. So you don't get this, uh, uh, you don't get this uh, incentive that you can, uh, that someone who, who can modify the system can modify it for their own benefit. So the system must enforce that if someone can change the access control, uh, it's not allowed to, to execute it themselves. Now that was everything for this time. Uh, thanks a lot.